So thank you for this honor and inviting me to speak uh, as the first presentation. Actually, quite difficult to do the overview of something which everybody knows. Uh, so it was quite a challenge for me. I couldn't sleep at night at all. Uh, okay, uh, so these are my disclosures. Uh, Obviously, we are speaking about uh, several millions of people uh, infected with HIV worldwide, uh, and we have uh, approximately uh, 800,000 of these in Europe. Uh, also, we could couple this, this with HBV, uh, but there are quite severe regional differences. Uh, so uh, we have majority now uh, of infections going in the east, uh, with most important uh, epidemics being seen there. A little bit, uh, a little bit of stability in the centre, and in the west uh, you have like 16% of cases of total uh, European uh, region. Uh, so we could see that there are quite numerous differences. And also the most, most important thing is, are the failed opportunities. So we have 90, 90, 90 goals and we have a lot of uh, gaps uh, in, in with respect of the people uh, who are on antiretroviral treatment, who are living with HIV and who are virally suppressed. And actually, the greatest gap is in the centre and in the Eastern Europe. So there is the greatest coverage failure there. Uh, so we have to think about it, how to address uh, these needs. And if you could see uh, at, uh, at the European countries, so the first, uh, we could look at the coverage targets uh, in Europe. So these are people who are diagnosed with, uh, with, uh, with HIV and who are on treatment with global target of 90 and regional average for Europe being only 64%. And it declines uh, when we go east. So obviously these data are still not perfect. There are a lot of gaps in these data. But when you go down, you can see that there is the suboptimal coverage in this uh, in this respect in many European countries still. And in terms of virological suppression target, we are not there yet, but it's getting uh, closer. So once the patient is diagnosed, is entering the treatment, the 90% uh, viral suppression target is actually uh, much closer. Uh, obviously still not in all the countries, but if you could think once the patient is there, uh, once the patient is diagnosed, we have them, uh, and most of them uh, are virologically suppressed. And this is our Polish example. You could see various treatments. I, I'm not sure if I know how to, how to work with this. Yes, I know. Uh, it's just like my hand is trembling, so good. <laughs> Try to do that. Uh, Okay, so we have uh, obviously people on PIs, non-nucleosides, integrase inhibitors, uh, triple therapies, but overall success rates are very good, and we could see that regardless of the treatment, uh, you have uh, very good um, uh, very good suppression rates. Obviously, for free drug class regimens, if, if there are free mixed drugs, these are suboptimal patients, these are patients who have been failing treatment in the past, so this is slightly worse, but it doesn't mean that the drugs are performing worse. This means that the patient selection was uh, more difficult. But still, if we would look at the full cascade uh, from the diagnosis to the full suppression, the, average, uh, the regional average for Europe is only 43%. So you could see how much gap we have in Europe and that it's actually uh, still far from, from closure. Obviously, countries are rolling out uh, safer, safer regimens, and this is what this meeting is about. We have rollout of integrase inhibitors, which have been seen over the last years, but there is a still good uh, basis for a protease inhibitor use and non-nucleoside use, which is declining, but which will be uh, still some, somehow used uh, in the future in some of, um, in some of the patients. Inter 
integrase inhibitors uh, are on the rise, obviously, across the countries. And if you would like to look at the recommendations, so this is what we have. This is our holy grail uh, where we stand. Uh, all the countries in Europe, basically, regardless, are in, regardless the region, are in the line uh, with EAC's recommendation, with a recommended uh, initiation of um, HIV regardless of the CD4 count and they are going towards more and more immediate therapy so there is a focus of, on immediate uh, uh, therapy initiation uh, especially in people with lower CD4 counts with people with uh, primary HIV infection and pregnant ladies and obviously we have these special populations which will be mentioned in a second uh, opportunistic infection we first need to decide what the patient uh, is having so we need to follow the diagnostic uh, pathway we need to check for tuberculosis and then start the treatment and obviously the tuberculosis treatment guidelines are slightly different and we have uh, a little bit of doubt in elite controllers still uh, basically all the countries discuss that in elite controllers you should start the treatment early but, the trans, uh, for, but more for the transmission and anti-inflammatory aspect rather than uh, for the patient or immediate patient benefit. Uh, it's, it's there but you have to still think about it. Obviously, the primary HIV infection is the time point where you should start almost on the same day. So uh, these patients, when they come, they are being started uh, with a hit and it's uh, in the guideline with acute infection, uh, severe prolonged symptoms, neurological symptoms, and aging patients being the uh, patients who will, re who will get the treatment basically immediately uh, without, any, without any delay. Uh, and these guidelines are being rolled up in Europe. You could see the drop of, uh, of a CD4 restriction in the last years. So there is a changing policy across uh, all the countries. So now most of the countries uh, basically initiate regardless CD4 count. There used to be first 200, then 350, then 500, which was dropped in national uh, policies and national recommendations. So these uh, guidelines are uh, basically followed. But still the time uh, from the from the patient uh, diagnosis to the start of the treatment across uh, the countries is uh, slightly delayed. You can see that uh, most of the people are being, are being started on treatment within one month of the diagnosis, uh, but it maybe should be reduced to weeks or days uh, to go towards immediate uh, antiretroviral uh, treatment. Obviously, these benefits of immediate uh, antiretroviral treatment have been uh, very well established and very well discussed, and this is a very nice meta-analysis recently published uh, with, uh, mm, uh, with uh, uh, actually Mm, uh, with actually uh, increased benefit of uh, rapid art in terms of uh, virological suppression. Uh, there is not so much benefit in terms of mortality, but there is better retention of care, better uptake within 90 days and uh, 12 months. Uh, so these are the forest plots. This is the first one re represents mortality, which is more or less very similar to the standard care. But if we would look at the retention, uh, in care, this is much favoured towards first-line uh, regimens. So we can see that this rapid initiation of antiretrovirals will be very rolled out across uh, national recommendations and it will be uh, beneficial for majority of the patients. And also, in terms of infectivity, we remember that the time, timeline of infection from the first patient, for the index case to the subsequent patient, is in 50% within one or two years. Uh, so if we treat them very early, this is also a phylogenetically uh, confirmed clinical benefit for the patient, so you could actually transfer it into the uh, patient care, that you need to treat them early for obvious uh, epidemiological benefits. 
And obviously we think how the late care entry and advanced HIV disease will affect uh, immediate treatment. So firstly, we need to think how many of these we have uh, in the uh, care, entering care. And actually, we have done recently a small Polish analysis for the whole country, and we have stable trends around 50% in some uh, groups like heterosexual, up to 75% of people are coming in late with CD4 count below 350 or opportunistic infection diagnosed. And uh, we have a more or less 30% uh, of people being diagnosed at the eighth stage. Uh, Obviously, uh, the, in, the in injection drug users, people who inject drugs, are diagnosed later and later, and this is the group which we actually miss. We are focusing very much on MSM populations, and the tiny bit of injection drug users are being diagnosed even later across time uh, as we uh, 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 later in the time than before in the, in the last years. Obviously, uh, the um, delayed the, 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 the early treatment was also uh, has also its disadvantages, and the risk of virus may be increased. This is why we need to delay it a little bit uh, in case of suspected opportunistic infection. We have to think about resistance. Uh, across countries, the resistance uh, is mostly less than 10%, but we have uh, in the guidelines, uh, the guideline for resistance testing. Uh, this is important from the perspective of immediate, re immediate treatment. Uh, if, need, if, a, if antiretrovirals need to be initiated before genotypic testing uh, is available, recommended first line are the drugs which have higher genetic barrier, and this is also important. Uh, for the future rollout of the regiments. So these are the current guidelines, which, uh, which are there across various countries. We have German, Austrian, we have Polish, we have BIVA guidelines, which have not been updated yet, I believe, from 2016. Uh, and uh, so they are quite old. We have JACIDA, which are being un updated quite nicely every year. We update our Polish guidelines every year. So you have uh, basically core regiments, which are there with dolutegravir, lartegravir, now bictegravir being implemented in most of the guidelines as well. Darunavir uh, boosted with cobicistat of Oritonavir, Relpivirin, and Doravirin, which is appearing now in some of the first line guidelines, like our Polish ones. We have included Doravirin uh, uh, from 2019 uh, to have it to have it available. One thing is inclusion of a drug in the guideline. The other is uh, drug availability. Please know that there are differences. So normally the guideline goes first and the country is purchasing drugs with slight delay. This is happening to us. We still do not have Duravirin available. We are in the process of availability of Bictegravir. It's in the guideline to push the government for the purchase, but we are still waiting for the full availability uh, for the patient. So these are current EAX guidelines which will be switched tomorrow and they will be, uh, the, the new version will be available tomorrow. So this is from the 9.1 version and uh, my expectation is that there will be the Raverin there. Uh, obviously this is not official, uh, you will see tomorrow when the, dra when the guidelines will be released. But uh, we remember that most of the guidelines are oriented around integrase inhibitors, but non-nucleosides with relpivirin and now new addition of the Raverin uh, will be there and will be actually important for expansion of options uh, for safety uh, and for the high efficacy. We have uh, Darunavir as a core agent with high genetic barrier, both boosted with Cobicistat and Tritonavir. Most countries have it uh, in the recommendations, so it will probably uh, stay there. These are our Polish guidelines. As I, as I have told you, uh, we have Doravirin uh, included uh, here. Good. Uh, my hand is more stable. Thank you. Um, 
Okay, so it's in both uh, of combinations. So the, this is our Polish uh, Polish example. Uh, HLA B570, well, one diagnostics is in place in most of the countries. And uh, I proudly remind you that it's one of the first and it's probably the only pharmacogenomic test which is there rolled out in any recommendation for the treatment worldwide. The cardiologists have tried to do it with warfarin, but now with newer drugs they dropped it. So this is the only pharma pharmacogenomic testing which is integrated into the clinical care consistently across uh, the world. Uh, conception and pregnancy, the guidelines actually uh, speak about women who are planning pregnancy in terms of uh, first line uh, treatment initiation and treatment naive pregnant women. So there are some rules who, which apply uh, for, um, con, uh, for uh, treatment continuations. And treatment naive, if you have early pregnancy, Immediate treatment is uh, actually uh, advised, and in late pregnancy, end of second trimester or later, prefer raltegravir or dolutegravir for the rapid um, for the rapid decline uh, of a viral load. Uh, you know this data. Uh, there is uh, there are agents to be avoided and uh, at pregnancy and avoided in con uh, at conception. Uh, increased risk of neural tube defects related to dolutegravir. Uh, these data have been uh, very far very well known from Tsepamo study and toxicity related to first line nooks uh, is known as well. Tough. Um, doesn't have enough uh, data for the pregnancy uh, to be used. Obviously, cobicistat uh, is also associated with uh, subtherapeutic levels. Um, so, these are all the cobicistat booster drugs are contraindicated now in uh, pregnancy. Uh, for tuberculosis, uh, we remember uh, the threshold of 50 CD4, cal of f CD4 cells, uh, which actually change the where we start the first line uh, regimens, and we have these uh, very important interactions with rifampicins, uh, where we need to double the dose of dolutegravir and raltegravir, uh, and we cannot use protease inhibitors. Everybody uh, remembers that, and if not, we have wonderful tool uh, from Liverpool, which actually lists all the drug-drug interactions uh, with uh, drug interactions associated with rifampicin, and very clear explanation why rifampicin is actually uh, re uh, is actually uh, why is it required to double the dose of uh, raltegravir or, or dolutegravir in case of rifampicin use. In this context, dolutegravir is slightly better uh, than um, concentrations are much more consistent if the dose is doubled than for raltegravir, uh, but uh, this adjustment uh, is there and it's needed. And the thing which uh, actually most guidelines do not cover, uh, which is still to be considered in Europe, is aging and frailty. So we have the first line options uh, for many groups, but the aging patients are not separated in any guidelines. We have to consider multimorbidity. We have to consider consider efficacy, we have to consider safety, but it's not that consistently uh, included uh, into the clinical guidelines. Uh, the frailty is where the multimorbidity will be there, so we will have the aging population, so we need to focus the guideline and drug-drug interactions there to see what will be uh, going on. Fortunately, again, uh, we have uh, very nice drug-drug uh, interaction tool from the Liverpool. Uh, people are switching off from protease inhibitors and boosted agents in the aging people uh, because of drug-drug uh, uh, interactions per se. Uh, obviously, we still need to think about women. Uh, in Western Europe, MSM populations are prevailing, but there are migrants uh, in the Central and Eastern Europe. The ratio of women which be, will be much higher, so these conception issues are very important for us for the future. And also, 
in some countries where access to treatment is actually delayed in some groups, so there is criminalization of HIV exposure, which is actually happening in our country, and we have cases to review where the patient is actually saying somebody has infected me and taking them to court. We have had uh, recently two or three cases for such a review, uh, criminalization of non-HIV exposure, uh, drug use and sex work. Mm, so this is also important in the context of U equals U statement is this patient safe legally or not uh, from, from all the other aspects. So uh, normally we try to say to the court, yes, there is a new and new statement, which means that the patient is uh, untransmissible, but it's still up to the court uh, to decide. And the, um, there is a still increasing problem related to the migration. So the uh, migrants in many countries, especially if they are not registered or uninsured, do not have full access to the HIV care, and they go um, mm, and maybe the, maybe the link uh, which is spreading the infection. Uh, there is obviously, there are differences in this suboptimal uh, linkage across Europe. So uh, the diagnosis is the, basal, the basis for everything, but there will be uh, differences in the people who are treated but not virally suppressed across the region. Uh, the highest number diagnosed of, of, and not treated is in the East, so we need to uh, remember that, that the rollout of treatment in these uh, regions are uh, very uh, important. So long-term efficacy will be measured as a time with undetectable viral load. Most of the first-line regimens are safer and uh, we get the treatment of optimization for toxicity. We have, we have it in the current guidelines with integrase inhibitors and newer um, non-nucleoside inhibitors. It's much safer. You and you will have to uh, bear in mind and the um, resistance will be more important in the setting of PrEP use. There will be wild PrEP, there will be people using PrEP suboptimally, so I think we still need to remember about the resistance uh, for the future. So thank you very much.